Uh, first of all, I just uh, I want to introduce Francesca Rossi, who is our uh, next speaker. Uh, she's the IBM AI ethics uh, global leader, a distinguished research scientist at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center, and a professor of computer science at the University of Padova, Italy. She's published uh, over 190 articles and many edited many, many volumes, and she's a leader in this field. And let's welcome uh, Dr. Rossi. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Matt, uh, for the other organizer for inviting me. Uh, so what I will say is also partly overlapping with what Matthew say, especially about AI and AI ethics and the issues around deploying AI, not just in healthcare, but in general. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, uh, I just want to add about my presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Matt, but uh, recently I resigned from my university professor position, so now I'm not a professor anymore. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, ju I mean, I'm at IBM, your town uh, lab. Um, and uh, uh, so, yeah, so what I wanted to say here is in general about my idea and uh, also IBM's approach about AI ethics, and then uh, go a little bit more specifically into um, applying this technology to healthcare. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so okay, so I don't need to tell you how much uh, uh, AI is in everywhere. We read uh, every day uh, newspapers and you know, magazine, all TV and so on. Um, but also how much uh, is uh, uh, really desired by students. Uh, so here is, for example, the MIT Intro to Machine Learning courses. You see how much it grew in terms of size uh, of the classes, uh, or Stanford, or in any other place. Uh, and uh, it's clear, and, in, and there are many reports that are, uh, say that, that AI is going to have a lot of uh, business value for many kinds of uh, um, sectors, uh, not just healthcare, but uh, in general. So these are some headlines of some reports that uh, say that you know uh, uh, all the sectors will use AI and will get uh, business value out of AI. So the applications are really uh, on a very very wide range. Uh, so you get, uh, for example, these home assistants or travel assistants. Uh, um, the you have the of course the ride sharing apps, uh, um, the chatbots for client and customer service. Uh, you have these recommendations uh, where again reinforcement learning is used for friends, uh, for purchases, for movies, uh, for anything. Um, you can have again medical image analysis, a treatment plan recommendation that Matthew also mentioned in healthcare, and also in the financial sector you can have credit risk scoring loan approval, fraud detection, so really, and in the judicial system as well. So there are really a, a wide, wide range of applications. Um, IBM, as you know, is spread all over the world, and it touches upon uh, many of these uh, application areas. So this is just some examples of uh, um, domains and specific applications that we looked at and we, we found, s uh, when we delivered solution for. Uh, like in compliance or in uh, um, in marketing, in customer care, you know, healthcare, IoT, in visual inspection of defects or maintenance problems, for example, in the media and so on. So, uh, just to give you an idea that really the applications are everywhere. Um, and so, why are these applications everywhere right now? Since AI, after all, uh, has been around. Uh, I mean, the name has been around since 1956. So how come that now in the last, let's say, five, six years, you know, uh, there is so, such an explosion of applications of AI? So I will give a brief, uh, very brief, much briefer than what I intended introduction to why, you know, we got here, um, because Matt already said many things. So first of all, just a, a clarification what we mean by intelligence, because of course this uh, term, intelligence, can be very misleading. We don't know what intelligence is for us, for human beings, so le uh, you can think that even less we know what it means for machines. So uh, in, uh, in the history of AI, uh, AI researchers have said, okay, let's uh, say that intelligence in a machine is actually rationality. It means 
that the machine, given a goal, uh, can understand what the best action or sequences of actions to, to take to reach that goal. Okay? Uh, and this, of course, uh, gave rise to a certain form of AI that we call narrow AI. So that these machines, given a specific goal, they are very good at finding the best solution to reach that goal. Uh, so in one narrow domain for one specific goal, which is different for, from the notion of general intelligence or strong intelligence, that uh, strong AI, uh, which instead is more similar to what we have, uh, <coughs> that uh, we can, we are very horizontal uh, in our intelligence. We can do many different things. Maybe for each one of the things, uh, the machine can do it better than us because he has much more uh, memory and computational power than us, but we are much more broader. And of course, our uh, horizontal kind of intelligence cannot be replaced by a lot of narrow machines because that's not the point. The point is that we have an intelligence that allows us to go from one problem to another one by, by analogies, by uh, uh, learning from one problem to, to get more general concept that we reuse on other problems and so on. And this still we don't have in a machine. So AGI, you know, a artificial general intelligence, is still not, not with us. We just have a lot of very, very uh, capable uh, um, narrow AI machines. So then the next slide is very, very similar to what Matt uh, uh, proposed uh, with, uh, again, some also timeline, because as you see, the concept of artificial intelligence and algorithms for artificial intelligence have been around since the 1956, uh, uh, in particular using that term. Um, but they were mostly at the beginning rule-based, so symbolic and logical reasoning. Uh, that means that they were addressing problems that that uh, we, we human beings could specify exactly. We could specify exactly what the input is, what the output is, what the goal is. And then uh, by thinking uh, with our mind, we could find the best algorithm to solve that problem. And then we were coding that algorithm into a machine. And then the machine was solving that problem in, in a very good way. And that works well in these uh, specific scenarios where really the problem is very well defined and you can find the algorithm. So if the uh, input is exactly what you had in mind when you thought about the algorithm, then you are sure that that algorithm, if it has some optimality property, you're sure that is going to be correct and is going to give you the optimal solution. But if the input is a little bit different, then that algorithm doesn't work anymore because it doesn't have what it requires to perform correctly. So, um, so over time, there were a lot of these algorithms that were used also for ill-defined problems, like uh, translations from one language to another one. We were trying to use these logical and uh, symbolic reasoning algorithms, but they were not working very well, or speech recognition. They were not working very well because those problems are not problems where you can exactly say oh, all the time this is the input that I'm going to get because there are too many variations, too much uncertainty. So then uh, people started uh, uh, trying to use these other techniques uh, based on machine learning, that saying, okay, if I cannot specify very well a problem and I cannot tell you what's What's is, what are the steps to get to the solution of the problem, I'm going to try to teach a machine how to solve a problem by giving a lot of examples of solutions. You know, the input and the output, uh, like the examples that Matt showed. And then I hope that the machine, by looking at all these examples, will learn more generally, we learn to generalize what it means to solve the problem, even if uh, I don't tell the machine exactly what are the steps to solve the problem, because I don't know these steps, because there are too many variations, like in interpreting an, in an image, for example. So these are the machine learning, uh, uh, this is a machine learning approach that were around since the 80s. So it's not a new thing. I mean, uh, deep learning has been around uh, for uh, re recently, uh, as shown here. But it's not a new thing. And the reason why they are very successful now, and they were not that successful, also the machine learning approaches in the 80s, is because now there is this uh, uh, co-presence. Co 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 uh, what happened? Okay. Uh, uh, something <laughs> was written there, <laughs> but I'll tell you what was written in the red box, <laughs> which is not uh, now uh, appearing. So 
because now we have uh, the presence of these three blocks. And one is the computing power, one is the algorithms that were improving all the time since the 80s, and the third one, so I'll let you guess what that is, <laughs> since it's data. Yeah, of course it's data. So, because this, uh, um, this methodology to give examples works well only if you have a lot of examples. Otherwise, otherwise if you're not covering enough all the possibilities of the input and the, the, the label which represents the output, then the machine cannot generalize well. And uh, in the 80s, we didn't have all this data. We were not posting on the internet, we were not uh, uh, writing, uh, we are not sharing data, so we didn't have all this data. But even if we had all that data, we didn't have enough computing power to deal with this amount of data. So now we have both things together with the algorithms and that's why we get uh, such uh, successful uh, results. And so some of these algorithms really took over the symbolic uh, uh, logical r reasoning algorithms, especially on those uh, problems that are ill-defined. Uh, like the typical perception problems, inter interpreting videos, uh, images, text, uh, speech, uh, and so on. Um, so the next uh, uh, thing that I would like to convey is that uh, AI and people, uh, at least right now, they're very complementary. So they can bring to the solution of the problem very different uh, contributions. Uh, we are very good at asking ourselves uh, new questions, so posing new problems. Uh, we are very good at common sense reasoning, which allows us to be very agile in talking to each other and in finding solutions, uh, and intuition, creativity, associations, uh, analogies, and so on. But on the other hand, AI uh, systems are much better at handling huge amounts of data, probabilistic, statistical reasoning, pattern discovery, and so on. And this is uh, one... Uh, uh, example that was given, uh, uh, was published in, I saw it published in 2016 in the strategic, uh, AI, um, uh, strategic uh, direction for AI given by the previous administration of the White House, um, by the OSTP. So, and he shows the error rate uh, in, a, in a breast cancer discovery task given by the, by the be to best top AI systems that had an error rate of 7.5%. And then the same task was given to the top pathologists that had an error rate of 3.5%. So if you are in this uh, competitive uh, uh, human versus machine approach, then you would stop here and you would think that uh, uh, humans, doctors, are still better than machines, uh, but actually then they, they, they try to get these uh, pathologists to work with the support of these AI systems and then the error rates drop down to 0.5%. So meaning that really the human doctors and the decision support systems of the AI system uh, was, were giving a really different contribution to the solution of the problem that together could really have the error rate drop. And uh, remember, this error rate is there because uh, when you use these uh, example-based uh, machine learning techniques, uh, you always have uh, uh, some uh, uh, even small error rate. That's that's inevitable. You will not be able to get 100% accuracy uh, because, uh, again, the problem is ill-defined. And if you had 100% accuracy, it means that you could replace uh, that machine learning system with the reasoning, with the exact algorithm. So in some sense, that error rate, even much, much very, very small, is the price to pay to have something that can be very accurate in most of the situations which are uncertain and not very clearly defined. Um, so the, the next uh, thing that I want to convey is that, uh, yeah, given this uh, uh, um, um, complementarity between uh, uh, human beings and machines, this is uh, something to consider when you deliver AI into inside an infrastructure where you want this AI system to be uh, uh, helping the professionals in that infrastructure to make their bad decisions instead of replacing them. And this is the case, I think, especially in healthcare, but also in the financial domain, also in many others. And IBM is in that domain. So usually we talk about enterprise AI, which is that kind of AI deployed to other companies to help their professional to make better decisions, and consumer AI, which is AI that you use in your company to deliver a service that goes to single individuals. 
so in enterprise AI, that's the whole point. You want to deliver AI to help these people doing their job in a, in a better way, making better decisions, more grounded. And of course, there are some challenges in doing that. Uh, <coughs> the fact that, first of all, you need to deliver something that can work well, interact well with human beings. Uh, also, usually these domains uh, where you are injecting AI are very heavily regulated, like financial domain or healthcare and so on. So you have to take into account these regulations. There is a lot of domain knowledge in the mind of these professionals uh, that you have to understand which one is better to code, which one is better to live into the uh, human being and so on. And there is a lot of natural language that people use when interacting with each other. And so you have to be able to uh, uh, understand, interpret well, or have a deep understanding of natural language, which we, we don't have yet in AI. Uh, also, in many situations, it's not true that you have a huge amounts of data, which is what makes machine learning very successful. So sometimes, especially when you tackle a new problem, you don't have a lot of data. So you have to uh, understand how to have machine learning to, to do something, even we, when you don't have a lot of data. Uh, and uh, finally, you have to deliver uh, AI system that can be accepted by these human beings and by the whole infrastructure in which they work. So to give a kind of cartoonish uh, way of delivering AI into an infrastructure, for example, a hospital, because we are talking about healthcare, but it can be any other infrastructure. So you have the company with their developers. The company delivers a piece of AI, like um, uh, a system that can uh, be delivered into, and it, it, this system does not go to a single individual, but goes into an infrastructure, for example, a hospital, where the doctor is going to use it to make better decisions in order to deliver a service, like uh, the decision of a therapy or uh, whatever it is, to a patient that is not alone, but he lives in a community. So the whole community will be impacted by that decision. So you see that there is a whole infrastructure to take into consideration when you, when you, when you design and develop and deploy that piece of AI. So, um, AI, as, as Matt also said, it has a lot of, uh, we said already that there's a lot of capabilities, but also a lot of limitations. So let me summarize here some of the limitations. One is common sense reasoning. We rely on common sense reasoning a lot when we talk to each other. So how can we deliver um, an AI system that can work with a human being that expects some common sense reasoning, but the AI system does not have much of that common sense reasoning yet. Uh, also, uh, <coughs> it's important that AI can reason and learn at the same time in various scenarios, in various tasks, in various situations. So these two uh, prototypical ways of doing AI, which one is the logical and symbolic reasoning that I mentioned before, and one is the machine learning approach, we still haven't understood how to combine them together. But they need to be combined together if we want AI to, to be more broadly intelligent, not just very narrow intelligent like it is now. Uh, and the third one, again, I said, very important to have a deep understanding and deep handling of natural language, because human beings uh, use natural language. They write, they speak, and so on. And still that is not very uh, developed in AI. We have a lot of question answering systems, uh, Alexa and or, or our, our telephone can understand our voice commands and so on, but uh, uh, they are just question answering. Uh, you won't find any, any system that can sustain a dialogue, a long dialogue, because that requires a lot of common sense reasoning. Uh, and then again, learning from from few examples and learning general concepts. But there are also limitations uh, that are related to ethical considerations, and some of them were uh, were all, all three of them were mentioned by Matt. One is the notion of bias that can be injected into data or in the model, and that can build that can bring the AI system to make decisions that are not impartial, not fair. Uh, to some group compared to other ones. Uh, the second one is the fact that you don't want to use a black box because otherwise you're not going to trust what the recommendation this black, so black box is giving you, so you need explainability. And the last one is robustness. So uh, the whole uh, issues uh, around ethical considerations uh, is because you need to build a, a, a system of trust around AI. 
of course, not trust, uh, just uh, justify trust, of course, uh, because if uh, people are not trusting these AI systems, they're not going to use it, they're not going to adopt it, so they're not going to get also all the positive effect uh, that this AI system can bring. So trust in the technology itself, so properties of the te technology should have, but also trust in those that, that deliver the technology. And the whole, and trust among regulators uh, and those that uh, uh, are impacted by the technology. And still, we are not there. We have to work to uh, get that level, of that uh, uh, business uh, system of trust. So again, trust in the technology has to do with bias, with value alignment, explainability, transparency, robustness, all things that were mentioned already, but also trust in the producers of the technology, how they're going to deal with my data, how they're transparent they are in what design choices they made in uh, developing uh, a certain system, and trust in the policy makers in general, so accountability, impact on jobs, uh, and so on. So if we go back to our cartoonish thing, some things do not be here, but in other minds. So you, you see that all these things that I mentioned uh, can be placed in some parts of this picture. So some have to do with uh, a data policy that is related to the company that is developed and uh, the devel developing the system. Some have to do with uh, the pro properties of the technology itself, fairness, explainability, uh, and so on, uh, robustness, and so on. Some have to do with uh, uh, delivering to the system, to the, to the doctor, so explainability is very important there. And some have to do with the awareness, the education of the professional that is going to receive this recommendation and he has to interpret this recommendation in the right way because remember, these recommendations are always going to be pro pro probabilistic because there is an error rate. So he has to interpret well what the system tells him in order to inject it into his uh, black and white, yes or no decision making uh, system. So to summarize this thing and to make it more clear, we at IBM we said, okay, let's focus about these four things. First, uh, I want to know whether the technology is fair and is aligned to my values. It follows my values and my uh, uh, principles. Second one, if it's easy to understand why it's doing something, if it is robust, and if it is transparent or explainable. So the bias issue, the fairness issue has been mentioned already. So if we put, uh, if we use a, a training data set, a set of examples that is not representative enough of all the possible situations, then the technology, the AI system will be um, uh, unfair. Uh, and this is just uh, somebody put together the, uh, a chart uh, uh, listing all the cognitive bias that we human beings have. So more than 180, so e even without knowing, so every time we make a decision, we have a lot of cognitive biases. And of course, since we are the one, ones who are going to design and develop this AI system, it is very probable that w if we don't think about it carefully, we are going to inject this cognitive bias into the AI system. To just uh, give you an idea, a very simple example of how the bias in the training data can, uh, can uh, imply some, uh, some, uh, something in the decision of the AI system. So here I just use Google Translate to do this translation. So first I took these two uh, sentences. He's a nurse, she's a doctor. I asked Google Translate to translate it into Turkish because Turkish does not have the gender. So in that step, the gender is lost. So now I took these uh, Turkish two sentences, so no gender there, and then I asked the system to translate it to English. And so in that step, the system had to guess the gender for each one of the two sentences. And of course, how did it guess this gender? Well, it looked into the training data. And so you see that that the training data, of course, told them that the majority of the nurses are women and the majority of doctors are men in the training data. So that's why the system did that. Now, I don't want to give this example to say that he had to go back to the, to the initial thing, but just to, to look at the, at the second step where what was in the training data implied what decision the system made in choosing the gender. And so that, that's not very influential maybe, but in some other cases, you know, what is in the training data can influence really uh, more high stake decisions. Uh, so it's important to help uh, uh, researchers and developers understand this issue of bias and how to detect it, how to mitigate it to make AI system more fair 
or at least more easy to understand whether there is bias and what kind of bias and so on. And to do that, at IBM, we put together this open source toolkit that everybody can contribute to, to co share code, uh, data sets, uh, training data sets, uh, the algorithms to detect and mitigate bias, uh, definition, various definitions of bias and fairness uh, to really create a community that can better understand how to deal with this uh, uh, issue. So the next one uh, is value alignment. So value alignment means that uh, um, when I give a goal to an AI system, uh, uh, I would like this AI system, of course, to achieve that goal, but at the same time to follow some ethical guidelines uh, or other forms of guidelines that I have in mind, but I don't want to tell him uh, all the time. So, for example, if I tell my self-driving car, take me home as fast as possible, yes, I want him to do that, but at the same time, I don't want to go the, the car to go much, uh, you know, to go higher than the speed limit or to run over other people or to make me car sick or whatever. You know, these are all, of course, an obvious constraints, but I don't want to tell all the time. I just want to tell in the goal. So how do I make sure that uh, these machine learning systems that are uh, whose success is mainly based on the freedom that they have to find the best solution to a goal, they use this freedom within some boundaries that are given by my ethical constraints or other forms of guidelines. So here are some examples, are kind of funny ones, but because they are using the game, online game domain, of uh, systems that were given a goal and the, the developer gave them a goal, but then uh, it got some uh, very undesired behavior of the system. So, for example, there was a an Eurisco game playing agent that uh, was asked to learn to play well and so to position itself very highly in the list of names and scores that you have when you play. And basically what it is, well, it went to hack that list. And so he didn't get learn to play Eurisco, he just hacked that list. But of course, that was the final goal but he had to do that by playing well the game, and instead he, he, he just bypassed that. Um, another one that was uh, killing itself at the end of level two to avoid losing at the, at, level, uh, at the end of level one, to avoid losing at level two, because he knew by reinforcement learning that if he had lost at level two, he would have had the very uh, negative reward signal, and he, he wanted to avoid that. Or uh, even this one, a robotic hand that, uh, whose goal was to be able to gra gra uh, grasp objects, grab objects, and there was a camera in the corner of the room that was supposed to check whether that goal was achieved or not. So that, cam that uh, robotic hand and arm was positioning itself in a way that the camera could not see if it was successful or not. So that to, to avoid the negative reward that would have come if uh, the camera saw that it was not successful. So obviously nobody programmed those behavior in. There was it was what machine learned to do by itself, uh, given the goal it was given. So th the goal that the developer gave the machine was the final goal, but the machine learned out of some freedom, uh, and this is important that the machine has a, the, some level of freedom because it may find solutions that we maybe we cannot find by ourselves, but at the same time it's important to uh, harness that freedom uh, in a way that uh, follows some, some uh, uh, values that align to our values. And uh, many people are working on that. Uh, the third one that Matt mentioned is explainability. We don't want to use black box. We are not going to trust them, so we need to uh, be achieve some form of explainability. And explainability is required to achieve trust, uh, to have accountability, redress in many domains, but also because sometimes laws require it. So this is a, a, an article of, a, of the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. It's a law that is in effect in Europe since March, two thousand May 2018 and it requires uh, some form of explanation, uh, here is called the, the meaningful information about the logic involved in the decision for algorithms that make a decision for some data subjects, so meaning individuals that provide the data for that decision. Uh, and of course, explainability is even more complex than fairness because not only you have to understand what is the right form of explanation, but also given one decision, you may want to give different explanations for that decision 
to different recipients because they use different terminology. They understand different things. In uh, a patient, an affected user may want a certain explanation, but the doctor may require a different one. Or even the developer may require an explanation to use as a debugging methodology. So uh, explanation just for one decision may mean many different things. Robustness is also mentioned by Matt, and again, uh, uh, this is very similar to what is shown, you know, this uh, one or few pixel thing. In this case, uh, this is a very famous example, one of the first ones that was found where there were problems of robustness. So that was recognized by the AI system as a panda with the 50, almost 58 percent confidence, and then it was blurred a little bit with this uh, other um, uh, picture. Uh, resulting in a resulting picture that to our human eyes is uh, more or less the same, maybe a little bit blurred, but it's, it's uh, still a panda. Uh, and, the, and the machine recognized it with 99% as, uh, as a, a, a gibbon. So it means that, what does it mean? It means that while we recognize this image as a panda because of some high level features, meaning the black, the white, the eyes, the shape of the eyes, and the, that's not the reason why the machine recognized it as a panda, because if we do it, those were the reasons, it would still recognize it as a panda here. So there are other things that the machine uses, and we have to be careful about what is used when recognizing. Another example that Ma similar to what Matt says, this is an example of a picture with very few pixels different. Uh, in fact, to us, they look exactly the same. And you see, these are the uh, label that was given uh, by this machine. Only in the first case it was recognized as the correct, uh, correct solution, but in all the other cases it was recognized as compl something completely different. And even more, I mean, this is kind of funny, but uh, look at this uh, picture here where uh, you have the image up there. Uh, it's uh, the recognized correctly in the upper right uh, box. Uh, but then uh, if you put this other image here, which looks the same to us, the machine does not see the pedestrians anymore. Right? So you can imagine how impactful that can be if it is put injected into a, a seven graph. So uh, let me go a little bit faster. So the last thing is transparency. Meaning, by transparency, I don't mean that those that, that build these AI systems should deliver the data and the algorithm. Of course, they cannot do that. This is a proprietary information. Call, yeah. But uh, they should deliver something that tells uh, the capabilities and limitations of these machines so that you understand which are the use cases that are suitable for these machines and which are not. Uh, so accuracy is not enough. Uh, is one important concept, but accuracy has many aspects, has, uh, false positive, false negatives, and so on. And moreover, you also should be able to say, okay, but what about bias? Uh, did you detect, uh, and did you mitigate bias, and what definition of bias did you use? There are many. Which one did you use? And what kind of form of explainability did you put in the machine, and so on. So similar to these other mechanisms that uh, we have in many other domains, uh, and we use all the time, to understand what are the use cases that are good for certain uh, product and which ones are not. Like this is not good for uh, kids that are you know, below a certain age, for example. And so that's why we really propose this uh, idea of uh, the fact sheet that basically says, okay, there are all these questions that need to be answered, and this answer must be reported and delivered together with the AI system that we deliver to our clients. Uh, and now one can discuss what are the right questions to, to, to answer, but uh, basically this is the idea, you know, to give this more transparency about uh, uh, what, the, what are the capabilities and limitation and the design choices that were made by building that machine. So a summary, what we do at IBM, a lot of different things, research, principles, and so on, but let's look more carefully uh, at AI and healthcare. But I see already that there is some... Uh, well, anyway, I hope ca you can read it. So, okay, specific to healthcare. So one thing, again, to go back to this principle that we think that AI should augment human intelligence rather than replacing it. And this is especially in healthcare where we want to help uh, 
decision makers, and usually in healthcare there are teams of decision makers, not just one, with different capabilities and different roles. So you have physicians, you have pharmacists, nurses, social workers, and so on. And so the AI should support the entire team to get a better decision by analyzing more data and so on. And, and <coughs> by analyzing more data and have uh, following guidelines and best practices. And again, uh, just as Matt mentioned before, why do we want to do that? So that these people can devote more time to things that are more human-like and th does not require uh, to spend all the time to look at to trial cases or to uh, summarize uh, things that are, have, have been done by others and so on. This can be done by the machine. But then the humans can spend more time in understanding better the patient, the attitude, the preferences, the, uh, and, uh, and um, more time you know, uh, sharing the experiences with other doctors and so on. So the second uh, uh, specific uh, uh, principle and idea is that of course, you want to use a lot of data to make a better personalized service, uh, but data is very fragmented in healthcare. So there is an issue of integrating these pieces of data to get the best and, and to discover more patterns and more insight out of, out of the data. So there has to be uh, the need of uh, building this trust between these different entities that are providing the data so they can share it. And also, the patient needs to be educated about what happens with the data that they're going to, to give to the AI system. Uh, at IBM, we have this uh, uh, data responsibility policy that says the data that are come from one client that we use to build a better system for our clients stay with their clients. They are owned by their clients. We don't use it to improve somebody else's uh, uh, solution. But of course, the more you share the data, and the more uh, overall you can improve the solutions. So the, the, the trade-off between uh, privacy of the data and uh, we call it data philanthropy in some sense, the fact that you allow your data to be shared to improve also the service to everybody else has to be clear also to the patient so he can make the, better, the best decision. Uh, then the third one and last uh, uh, principle uh, is about uh, uh, transparency and explainability. So again, in delivering this AI system into this big infrastructure in, in the healthcare domain, it's important to uh, be able to show clearly you know, the compliance to the regulation, of course, uh, but also how we curate the data, how we choose the data, how which design choices we made, how which form of explainability we put into the system, uh, and, and, and then and trying to uh, use the form of explainability that is useful for each of the recipients, the doctor, the nurses, the patient, the developer, and so on. So these are the main uh, issues that I think uh, in, in um, my mind also are. But one last thing that I want to say is that uh, in some sense, these machine learning approaches that, uh, you remember, you always have this small percentage of error, are in some sense, uh, they have some similarity with drugs because I'm also drugs. Uh, they work well for the vast majority of people, but they do harm a small minority of people. Even if the drug is you know, the best that you can have and overall it's going to do a lot of good and so on. So there is a process that the society has put in place, an agency or whatever, depending on the countries, eh, that uh, by following that process, even if there is a small percentage of harm that that drug is going to make, society says, okay, it's acceptable for me and this is, doesn't matter that there is this small percentage of, of harm, but I think that this drug overall is going to be good and I'm going to deliver it. And if I follow that process, uh, then uh, okay, I have the uh, ability to deliver that drug. And the same uh, similar thing is with machine learning. You know, we know that it's going to make uh, bad decisions, incorrect decision in a small majority, in a small minority of cases, but it could be that we will put in place a process, a mechanism for which society can accept even if we have that uh, small percentage of error. So I'll stop here. Thank you.